it looks pretty good, right? And just to be clear what we're seeing here, right? This is, there's no motor, no controller. He gives it a little push. It's on top of a small ramp and it's just falling with gravity. And um, I showed you earlier, this is that you can take that design to an extreme. This is a 3D passive dynamic walk, walker with knees and arms, right? And it looks beautiful, more beautiful than the asthma walking that I showed you you know, before. <clears throat> and what's amazing is that the analysis of that is also very simple and elegant, okay? Uh, the same inspiration that sort of made these, the hardware come to life gave us some of the first simple models of walking. This is the, the view from reverse. That's a little bit of a, is that a hook or a slice? I, but, uh, you know, a little bit of a curve to it. Okay, and we have beautiful simple models that we can run in a simulation and understand. Okay, and the simplest one, the simplest we'll ever get of a walking robot is that kind of boils it all down to its essence is this model called the rimless wheel, okay? So just take a bicycle wheel, take the rim off, okay, you just got the spokes, put it on the top of a small ramp and give it a little push and what you'll see is it falls down the ramp, of course, but what's amazing about it is that if it's spinning fast, Okay, there's, what are the dominant dynamics in this, this machine, right? So um, when, it's, <clears throat> when it's, it's, every time it takes a step, it gains a little bit of potential, or it converts a little bit of potential energy into kinetic energy because it's moved down the ramp a little bit. But then there's also a loss because the collision with the ground loses some energy. You dissipate a little bit of energy on every step. And what's amazing is those two things can fall into a balance, and they do very robustly in this system. If you start rolling it fast, as we'll see, we'll try to understand the dynamics. If you start rolling, rolling it fast, then the impacts are bigger than the potential energy you get out and it will slow down. If you start rolling it too slow, then actually gravity wins and it speeds up and you get a stable periodic motion out. Okay, where exactly the balance, the, the losses from, from collisions are exactly balanced by the gains in, from gravity going down a ramp. And it's a very robust phenomenon. You can change the ramp, you can change things. It tends to always have some stable limit cycle. Okay, so I, today the goal is to, you know, partly to understand that system. We'll go a little more complicated than that too. But to these basic ideas of what is a limit cycle, how do we take our notions of stability, extend them from points and trajectories to talk about cycles? What are the tools that will help us work with that? Okay, so yeah, I, actually I'd say the two big goals for today are would be showing you how to think about st from stability of a fixed point or a trajectory, we're going to go to um, of a periodic cycle. The first goal, and the second goal is um, to give you some notion of contact. Our first models of making and breaking contact. Okay, and both of those will serve us well in, in many places. Okay, so <clears throat> I used the word already. If we talk about stability of a periodic cycle, the word that comes into play is a limit cycle. Okay, so a limit cycle is uh, a periodic trajectory that is the limit set of some dynamical system, okay? so. Uh, it actually can be stable or unstable, which would be the limit set of the time reversed system. Okay, but we've already seen some examples of that. Um, remember, we talked about the Vanderpoel oscillator, our periodic uh, polynomial system. We studied it before in in reverse time because we were, we were doing the region of attraction. Okay, but now we're actually thinking about it forward in time. 
And the trajectories of that system are characterized by some of these arrows that I drew here, okay? So if we're outside this sort of black region, then we tend to, we'll, still, we'll always be going around, we're in a face portrait, we'll always be going around clockwise, okay? But the trajectories from outside tend to converge to this black line from the outside. The ones on the inside, will, apart, there's a fixed point at the origin, but apart from that origin, all other trajectories will spin out and converge to this black line, right? So this is a classic example of a limit cycle stability. All trajectories, except for the fixed point, will converge to that black orbit. Um, but we have to be a little careful about how we define stability in that sense, right? So let's say I'd like to, I mean, I have, I'll have notions of asymptotic stability, exponential stability. You can even have the Apinot type stability for limit cycles, okay? But let's, how, do, how do we define that? So before asymptotic stability to a fixed point, was, you know, if, if I started with x0 is some fixed point plus some small deviation, right, then we said that the limit as time goes to infinity of the difference between x and x star, that goes to 0. So we need a corresponding definition. Now that x star is not a point, but it's an orbit, a periodic orbit. Right? So a periodic orbit just can be de defined simply by saying that there is some period capital T for which this is true. And we just need to extend our definition to you know, asymptotic-like stability and all the variants for a periodic solution. How do we do it? Now, there's the, the first way you might think, the way we talked about stability of a trajectory, right? We just said that x, of, uh, you know, that basically x perturbed and x original converge over time as time goes to infinity. That actually doesn't work even for the van der Poel oscillator. Why does that not work? If I were to just ask, for, does, is this system stable in the sense that for any point on this cycle, I perturb it, do those two trajectories come back and the difference between those two trajectories is, is zero as time goes to infinity? Yeah. Yes, exactly right because there's a direction here where if I perturbed it along the, the orbit, then those two could stay out of phase forever. Right, does that make sense? So we need a, a definition of stability that allows us to collapse to the orbit, but allows also that we don't collapse if we're two different points on the same orbit. Okay, and that's called orbital stability. The way we write it is, is, is simple enough. We'll just say there exists some tau for which x of t minus x star of tau, the limit of this goes to, you know, this, I want this thing to go to zero. Or the limit as time goes to infinity of this thing equals zero. Okay. So your, your notion of distance that goes to zero is your distance from your current state to any point, you know, the minimizing tau on the orbit. Okay, easy enough, right? So the distance is already zero everywhere on here. If I'm off, then it's just that distance that has to get smaller. Okay, and importantly, both the van der Poel oscillator and the rimless wheel are not st stable in the sense of a trajectory and most limit cycles aren't, okay? But they are stable, they are orbitally stable. 
right? There's important theorems that I won't write carefully, but the Poincaré uh, and poincare bendixson theorems are the, the theorems about, uh, you know, what can a differential equation do? So imagine if you have, for instance, an invariant set. If you know you have an invariant set in your state space for a differential, for an ODE, or an ordinary differential equation. If you know, for instance, that there is no fixed point inside that invariant set, then the poincare bendixson theorem says there must be a limit cycle. Because there's only so many things it can do. If, if the function is defined at every point in, in space, you know, if it, there's no fixed point, and it has to stay inside there forever, it must, the only thing left for it to do is to converge somewhere to a limit cycle. So you know a limit cycle exists inside there. And there's powerful theorems like that, but they are all, they are you know, similarly related that you should not expect a limit cycle if it exists to be stable in the trajectory, only stable, orbitally stable. Okay, and you can write um, you know, comparable versions of this. You can ask for it to, that distance between your point and the orbit to go down at a rate of, of, of an exponential. You can ask for it to just be you know, for every delta ball, for every epsilon ball, there's a delta ball. You can ask all the, all the ana analogous questions in orbital stability. Okay, so then the interesting question then is like, how do I analyze the stability of these things, right? So before we talked about uh, local stability. We could take linearizations. We can look at the eigenvalues, for instance. We could start finding linear uh, you know, quadratically open up functions for linear systems. All of those tools that we had for fixed points and even extended a little bit for trajectories, we'd like to have that same toolbox for limit cycles. Okay? And guess what? It, it all works, but it takes a little bit of effort to, to see it. Okay? There is a notion of linearizing around an orbit and checking the conditions of orbital stability along an orbit. You have to be a little careful about how you do that, and we'll do that in a future lecture, because there's an even simpler concept, thanks to Poincaré, that makes um, analyzing these things really nice and easy. Okay? And that is the notion of a Poincaré map. How many people have heard of Poincaré maps? All right. think about Poincaré maps, what I want you to think about is that for differential equations of this form, you can actually analyze the stability of a limit cycle as the by analyzing the stability of a fixed point. You can convert the limit cycle question into a fixed point question, okay? And we'll do it for the Van der Poel oscillator because that's particularly simple. So the way um, the, way the Poincaré map um, tools work is you define a surface of section okay so the picture I want you to have I have Q and Q dot and I've got some nominal limit cycle that's going around like this okay get to use my multiple colors today I want to define a surface of section, and what I'll do for this example is I'll choose, it's not as different as I was hoping, but I'll choose the y-axis here, the positive y-axis. Is that, the color is good enough? Yeah? Okay. And what I want to do is I want to take the, orb, the solutions of the, of the full dimensional system, but I only want to study them every time they cross that axis, okay? And so what you'll see is that if the orbits start like this and go around like this, okay, then, <clears throat> then I'll have a discrete time system that evolves like this, boom, 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 and eventually gets closer to the fixed point. And I'm from the outside, I cross around, okay? And the evolution of the discrete time system that I can define on this Poincaré map looks like this. 
Okay, oops, stops there. So the I can analyze the limit cycle stability of the continuous system by analyzing the fixed point stability of the discrete system every time I cross the, the map. Okay, so I would expect if this system, the strong statement of Poincaré, again, because trajectories can only do so many things, if you have a differential equation that's defined over a, over a vector space like this, okay, that um, if I have the guarantee that every time I leave the surface of section, I come back to the surface of section, and I have a fixed point on the surface of section, then that fixed point must correspond to a limit cycle in the original space. That's the basic idea. Okay, so the way we do it is we define a surface of section. I'll write it like this. It's some subset of, of my state space. In this system, I'll write it as Q0 and Q dot greater than or equal to zero. Okay, that's a lower dimensional, because I've got an equality constraint there. That's, a, that's if I have an n-dimensional state space, then my, my surface of section will be an n minus one dimensional object in general. And I can convert, again, the continuous evolution of the n minus, uh, the n-dimensional system into a discrete evolution of the n minus one-dimensional system. Yeah? If I do it for this, then let me call that the, a point on that system, xp, and I'll write a dynamics now. This is a P for Poincaré, I'll say that the dynamics of this are given by some Poincaré map. Right? This is just a, now a discrete time system that talks about every time I cross that map. Solving for P analytically can be hard, because in general you'd have to integrate over the entire loop to do that, so we'll come back to that. Turns out taking linearizations of it and stuff is easier than, than integrating it, okay? But in mathematically, we can say that this map, if it exists, is something we can analyze. And if I draw it for I just draw that function P for the van der Poel oscillator, then what I'll see is it looks sort of like this. At zero, it's zero. It kind of goes off like this. And just like we had graphical analysis for first order continuous systems, we can kind of do graphical analysis for discrete systems. Um, the, the important visual cue in a discrete time system plot is the, is the line of slope one because you can sort of imagine that the points where xp equals xp of n equals xp of n plus one, those are the fixed points of the system. So I can just see graphically, I can just read off here that these are, there's two fixed points. There's a fixed point at the origin, and there's a fixed point somewhere up here. Okay, and those map to the fixed point here and the fixed point that is, corresponds to the limit cycle. You can even do, um, you can sort of analyze the time, the, you can graphically analyze the evolution of a iterated map like this. If you ever take a class on um, fractals or chaos theory or anything like that, you would, you'll do a lot of exercises like this. There's simple examples of chaos that, that use this kind of thing. Okay, but <coughs> the, the simple way to do it is you start with some initial guess, you project 
If you said if I started with some initial XP, I want to see how it evolves. Well, the next XP you can find by just projecting to this line and then projecting across. That gives me my next XP. And it turns out that you can just evolve the, the iterated map of this and it will converge from all of these initial conditions along here to this point. Similarly, if I started here, I iterate and I'll converge to that from the other from the other side. Yes. Why is this line uh, so closely tied to the location of the fixed point? What what defines a fixed point in continuous? So for in continuous time, a fixed point is when um, x dot equals zero. In discrete time, a fixed point is when x p equals x p n plus one, right? So that that corresponds to any place where on the x axis. I put it through the map, I get the same thing on the y-axis. That's the line of slope one. Thank you for asking that, yeah? And similarly, I can look basically at the slope of this line and I can tell whether things are locally stable, right? If the slope is between negative one, we know about the, how to, so, some of you uh, who've taken, you know, lots of controls classes know that you would take the eigenvalues for a discrete time system have to be between one and negative one. Okay, and that's, that's graphically similar to these staircases converging. Okay, and this is an unstable fixed point. If I were to start here, it actually goes. Okay, I, I, I decided not to sort of do the full treatment of how to do graphical analysis in a discrete time system, but know that it's there if you ever want it. Okay. What's essential is that the tools of stability still work and the tools of stability for, uh, in discrete time here say something about the limit cycle stability in the, conti in the continuous time system. Yes? Now just to clarify, the map can only, or your surface of interest can only intersect with staircase one for the implementation of that order? Good, yeah, so, well the, the definition of P if you will, is from any one crossing to the very next time it crosses. That defines P. So, you know, the, this crosses many times on any one big orbit, right? Infinitely many times, okay? But the map is defined uh, in this way. If you chose a more crazy surface of section that was, I mean, I don't know if I recommend it. I'd have to think about this. But if you chose a surface of section that did something like this, or you know, that, that that sort of crossed, then I think it would still be defined. You would have to think about, um, you know, but it would be the the next crossing. That's the definition. Yeah. Okay. Um, does that mean that you're just missing a dimension in the interval that there is some section and that might then be where it ends up then? A really interesting question. Okay, so you could imagine trying to have, um, you know, what would happen if you had a system that sort of bounced around this? Um, so in a continuous time, you, you, you just flow to a fixed point. You could never cross over. But in discrete time, you could actually have a system that was marginally stable and that would bounce around but never converge. That would be a corresponding to an eigenvalue of one, for instance, of exactly one or negative one. It would, would, would oscillate. Uh, so that can happen in discrete time systems. Uh, you, always we want to be doing this in the full dimensional space. So yeah, if you saw something like, like that and you miss a dimension, so um, I mean, this is making a particular statement about the n-dimensional system. You could ask whether that's a good enough model for your system and get into those more subtle questions. Yeah. I prefer to say that I know the true dimensional state and let's analyze it. Good. So if we can compute this, then the local stability would be based on, for instance, taking the gradients of this, and, P, <coughs> and if the eigenvalues of this 
are less than or equal to if the absolute value of the eigenvalues are less than or equal to one. That's a that's the that's like saying I have a x n plus one equals a of x n, which is, that system is stable if the eigenvalues of a are all within the unit circle or are all less than or equal to one. Okay. So that's amazing. That's like just an amazingly good t tool. Something that looked much harder, the stability of a cycle, can be reduced to something we already know about, the stability of a discrete time system converging to a fixed point. Okay, that's the most important thing to understand. Now, like I said, getting P can be hard. In fact, for the, for, there's no closed form solution for the Van der Poel oscillator for, for that trajectory. We can get it numerically. We can analyze its gradients numerically, okay, and check its stability, but it actually can be hard to get closed form solutions for P. So we often want to work, find methods that don't require a closed form solution of P. I feel like I didn't nail that one for you guys, I mean, just based on people's expressions. But uh, ask, ask questions to make, to make sure you're happy with that. Yes? This is a choice, a modeling choice. The question is, why is the map discrete? So the continuous trajectories are this, right? And I'm going to, I can ask, the question is, what happens if I define a new system which just jumps from this solution by integrating across and then waiting until the next time it crosses that, right? Now, the Normally, we write a discrete time system as having like uh, the mapping between continuous time and discrete time would have like a fixed time step. This, you could have a different duration between those. So the mapping, when I say discrete time, maybe that's what's misleading. It's not necessarily like at, uh, you know, 0.1 seconds later, it's going to cross. This is a d defined by the zero crossing of, a, of that surface of section. It's an event-based discrete time. Yeah? but that's a modeling choice. I could just define the system. Every time I see it cross that line, I'm gonna write down the state. That gives me a dynamical, a discrete dynamical system. Good, any other questions? Yes. Um, is, it, is it that if you can find one surface of a section for which this holds, then any other surface of a section you find will also have its own? Yep, that's exactly, that's the, exactly the intuition is that, um, that if I, can, if I know that I'm gonna always cross this section, right, then the orbits can only do a certain number of things. That means that yes, I could have picked another section at some other angle, and it must be that convergence, um, that certainly the, the stability properties of the limit cycle. It could have been things, things that were contracting here, could be spreading out here, but over the entire cycle, if that system is stable, the stability statements hold for any of those sections. The rates and other things could be more subtle, but just is it stable or not, absolutely has to hold. That's an interesting, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, I, I missed the part, why does Q not have to be zero? Uh, this is, so good. So for an arbitrary system, for the rimless wheel, we will choose a different surface of section. For the Van der Poel oscillator, specifically, I just made this choice because I, it's easy to plot. Sorry, I didn't mean to conflate those two. This is not always the surface of section. For a more general system, you have an n-dimensional system, you have to pick some n minus one dimensional definition. And depending on where you choose it, it might be easier or harder to do the math to get, the, to get P. Yep, so what I'm gonna do to make one, so I'm gonna just like plot this, okay? So to make one point on the plot, okay, I'm gonna take a current XP, that means I'm somewhere on the map, right? And I wanna figure out where to draw the, the line here, okay? So you give me, you know, I'm, I'm in matplotlib or whatever, I'm for this XP, what, how do I define XP n plus one? I put it on that surface, I run the simulation until the next time it crosses the surface, and I draw my point there. 
Okay, so this is just a mapping that says when I'm at xp, and the next time I hit the surface, I'm going to be at this xpn plus 1. And if it's above the line, that means it's getting bigger on that, right? It's, it's moving uh, you know, up on that surface. And it's below the line here. That means it's moving down. Cool, OK. That's a crash course in limit cycles. But the main idea, of course, is that we can actually use most of our tools from that we already had just apply with this notion of orbital stability and the notion of Poincaré maps. Okay. The second thing I said we need is a basic model of contact. Okay. So let me do a ba give you some basic models of, of contact. Do it here. And then we'll put it together and make sure we understand what happens with the rimless wheel. And we'll go a little as far as much further as we have time for. Okay. Okay, so modeling contact is a big topic. Um, and the models you choose might be different if your goal is to write a simulator or your goal is to do trajectory optimization or your goal is to do mathematical analysis. There's many different models that are good for different things, okay? So let's just take the, the rimless wheel, for instance. I didn't draw it very well this time, but I'll draw it more carefully in a second here. So let's say I, I'm worried about what happens when this foot comes and hits the ground. Okay, that's my basic question. Is what, how should I model the interaction between I mean, even this foot and the ground? Uh, is an inter interesting question, but let's even th we'll think about the uh, about both of those cases when you're already on the ground, when you're making contact, and when you lift off on the other side. Okay, the simplest model, if I just abstract now to just one leg, okay, and the ground here. The simplest model, especially when the once the leg is in contact, I could just put a spring between the foot and the ground, as, and, and possibly even a spring and a damper. Sometimes people write a dash pot like this, okay? And have a, have a force that's just trying to push my foot back out of the ground. This would be a spring damper model of contact. And those can be good for some things. They can be really good for simulation, for instance. But they can be nasty for analysis um, because typically to get a reasonable you know, model, I, I actually think this is a pretty good model of what the real world is like, okay? We are, we are never like a rigid object on, you know, you never have like rigid steel on rigid steel, or if you do, it doesn't go well, right? But all, all of your robots, everywhere they touch the world have a little bit of rubber or something, okay? So there's always some sort of spring uh, lying around. But that, but modeling that spring often requires big values of k, right? Big <coughs> stiffnesses, and that can make the numerics of your uh, of your differential equations bad, right? It might be that you have to take a very small time step in order to simulate a very stiff spring accurately. If you choose your spring soft, then your robot kind of sinks into the ground unnaturally. But the dy dynamics are beautiful, right? They're ni nice and smooth and and good. Okay. <clears throat> but so the spring damper models are one important class. But it turns out, um, even though rigid is a bad approximation probably of the real world, it gives beautiful equations. Okay. So what we'll do instead, actually, for the rimless wheel in particular and for a few other models, I'm going to just assume, actually, that I have a pin joint here. I'll assume that it's rigidly attached and it's not sinking in whatsoever, and I'm going to just do that by modeling that as a pin joint. Okay, and then at the moment that this foot comes in contact with the ground, I'm going to snap a new pin joint in. Okay, now if I'm, I have to be careful. It turns out that for the rimless wheel, I can actually say the moment that I snap this pin joint in, I can actually release this one, and I get away with that. But more generally, you have to keep track of which joints are, which pieces of your robot are in contact, which aren't. Okay. 
and you have to make sure that you keep track of energy when you, and, and velocities and the like when you come into contact with the ground in order to have an instantaneous change of your topology to have like a pin joint suddenly happen. That means you had to impart some energy into the ground and you have to account for that. Okay, so these models where I um, snap between different um, sort of joints, these are gonna be hybrid dynamics models. of rigid contact. Hybrid is like such an overloaded word in the world, right? It's not, I don't mean gas and electric, I don't mean, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a bunch of different uses you could even use in robots, but um, this is discontinuously changing between different models, yes? Did we ever address slipping or like between friction? Absolutely, we can address slipping. So. Great, great question. So if we're doing slipping, then I, what I would do is I would have a pin joint here, but I would check whether I'm in the friction cone, okay? If I start slipping, I could put in a slider joint that moved along here, okay? That's all, it, that sounds bad, but that's kind of all you have to do. You know, then you're done. There's nothing else, you know, like, but, but you do have potentially, uh, you know, three to the end possible, uh, hybrid modes that you'd have to think about in, in the full glory. So we tend to do this a, you know, a lot for simple walking models and we don't do it for dexterous hands for that kind of reason. There'd be a lot of joints to keep track of. Yeah. Good question. That's great. So, so what happens in simulation if I'm, if I'm simulating along and I, and I like, past my, my ground, so we actually do event detection. We do more advanced simulation to, if we do cross there, we do, we have a, a zero crossing event that happens, and we will back up the simulation and do variable step, you know, and find exactly the time up to some large or small tolerance um, in order to find the exact moment of, of that transition. And these can be very, very accurate simulations. So we actually tend to use more advanced integrators, continuous um, integrators with, with zero crossing detection and event-based event, event -based simulation for these. Okay, so this moment of, of, at the moment of impact, we have, um, we have an instantaneous change in the topology. We're going to add a pin joint. Or more, more generally, in the, in the generic case, we're adding a constraint. Think of it as there's some function of the uh, position of the foot, which is a function of Q equals some constant. You know, position of foot, yeah, even in space, equals some constant. That's what a pin joint does, okay? And in general, you can talk about taking a differential equation and turning on or turning off a quality constraints. And a couple things happen. First of all, the dimensionality of the system effectively reduces for every equality constraint. But in order to satisfy that constraint, you have to model the, the event, the collision event. So we have an impulsive, in our case, inelastic, we'll model it, collision event. So that's all very general and a little generic, but we can make it, I think, very concrete by looking at the equations of the Rimless wheel.
Okay, let me draw it a little bit more carefully this time. My rimless wheel, I'm going to put it on a ramp. I'll call the angle of the ramp gamma. I'll make my wheel have a point mass. Okay, point mass M. Of course, I got gravity going down. I tend to call that angle 2 alpha. It makes the math a little cleaner if you use the half angle as the, as the parameter alpha. Okay, and I want to define this, this angle here as theta, the angle between the, the stance leg and the world and the ramp uh, relative to the world as theta. Okay, and it's got a length, leg length L. They're all the same despite my drawing capabilities. I feel like I need one more spoke there too, just to make it. You can have any number of spokes, but that looked a little better to my eye. Okay, um, <clears throat> so the assumptions in the model here, we're gonna have a pin joint at the foot. We'll have an inelastic instantaneous collision. And I, and I will just assume infinite friction for now, but we could definitely handle that sliding friction case too. And this assumption that it's inelastic, basically just this implies um, no bouncing, right? When your foot hits the ground, all the energy is absorbed and you're not going to bounce back off it, um, right? If you had an elastic collision, you could restore some energy. <clears throat> and then the last assumption, which I wish I had left myself a little more space here, is that we're going to assume there's no double support. It, it's actually sort of implied by the inelastic assumption, right, that when swing foot comes off the ground, or hit, you know, hits the ground, the stance foot comes up. has to be the case because if you have some energy, some rotational energy, and you come down and this foot stops, the system, the angular momentum around this point of collision is going to be conserved, so that back foot has to come up at exactly the same instant. Now, since I'm predictable, okay, you won't be too surprised to see if I have a point mass here, Okay, and massless legs, right? And I have a pin joint here. Then the dynamics are the dynamics of a pendulum, right? So it looks like an eyeball. And we can understand most things. It's like an eyeball that has some these extra things happening here. So we can actually understand beautifully the dynamics because of all the things we understand about the phase portrait. Okay, so where does it live on that eyeball here? So the angles, I say I, I put the, the upright here, okay, but basically there's some angle just below the upright, which is like gamma minus alpha. There's some angle a little above the upright, which is gamma plus alpha. And the solutions of this equation live, let me go for one more color here, in the rolling regime, they live up here, okay? Because you're kind of going over that upright, right? This is the upright fixed point. But if you have velocity and you're going over, then you'll get this part of the space. Okay, 
Okay, so this motion of rolling over the top of a pendulum, that puts you in that part of the, of the state space. And then what happens is we model the inelastic in impulsive collision. This will eventually come here, okay? It'll hit this place where the foot hits the ramp. We'll model the losses, okay? So we're gonna lose a little bit of, of angular velocity because of the impact. And we're gonna do this presto change -o. suddenly this becomes the pin joint. And so my coordinate system moves to here. And I'm back. So that's, that's sort of equivalent to just jumping back to changing to the other side where the, the other foot was just coming off the ground. Right, does that make, this is somehow, these are the two places where the feet touch the ground. But when, this is the, when theta is on this angle and this is when theta is on this angle. And it pops back, right? I don't know if I did that well enough. It's, This is when this foot just came up, and then when this foot comes around, I should have, they all look the same in that, which is what they must look like, but um, when this front foot hits the ground, then that front foot becomes the back foot, boom, and I've moved over to this part of the plot, and I'm gonna lose a little bit of energy, okay, and then I'm, guess what, I'm gonna go right back here, and I'll find myself a stable limit cycle that's punctuated by this discrete event. Yeah? So you're, uh, so you're traveling this, you're, you're gaining energy uh, from gravity, is that right? Or do you like, get back up? So where does the gaining energy come? Right, so the fact that there's an, there's an asymmetry here caused by gamma means that you have, if, if, if these were exactly the same distance from the upright, then you wouldn't gain energy, right? So I would just come here and I'd go back to the same level. But because the ramp tilts me this way, I start with this amount of energy. This is a curve of constant energy, okay? But because I'm, I, have, um, I have more angular velocity when I hit here, and then when I change coordinate systems, it's somehow the combination of that, that I have more velocity when I change coordinate systems that I gain energy. And I lose energy by the impact. Okay, so let's play with it a little bit. Here. Okay, so just to convince you that if you start it going fast here, it slows down, okay? You started going very fast, still slows down, okay? If you start it slow, it actually speeds up. It's a little harder to see, okay? You'll see it in the plot, in the phase portraits in a second here. If you start it backwards up the ramp, it can actually still find its way back into the stable rolling fixed point. It's a really robust thing, okay? But let's draw the face portrait here, okay? So this is exactly what I tried to draw here, right? I drew my surface of section. The surface of section this time is a little bit goofy. To make it work for all of the different possibilities, I draw the surface of section here and here. You'll see why as we analyze the different cases, okay? But let's just, just worry about this for now. For rolling forward, that's enough. Okay, for rolling forward, if you just think about this being the exact analogy of the surface of section we did for the Van der Poel oscillator, which is a, you know, the, the moment the foot hits the ground or right after it hits the ground, okay? And I look at the return map then, I can plot that return map, but first I just simulate it, I, it goes forward, it gains a little energy and it goes into the stable limit cycle. Okay, so if I start it with a little bit more energy, like a little bit faster, this is like basically the, the fixed point. If I start at like 
a little bit more, then it'll slow down. If I, I'm, if I speed it up even more, you know, then it actually, from many, you know, it takes many steps, but it'll still slow down and hit that same stable limit cycle. The interesting thing is when you start going like backwards up the hill, for instance. So what do you think is going to happen on this map if I go, um, let's say, negative 4.8, I think I just did, right? OK. I'll do a simpler one first. Let's start, let's start with too small. I'll do 0 0.5, OK? So what happens if I do too small of a velocity? So in the eyeball, if I were to start with a velocity that's below, that won't get past the upright, then what's that correspond to? That's like, I started going up, but I didn't actually get over the top. So I went back down, and I had another collision here, which jumped me over to here. And I can get trajectories that look like this, right? So I can go, boom, to here, to this, to, to here, to this, to here, to this. Is that clear? And I'll eventually come to rest like this. But this model actually never comes to rest. It comes, it has infinitely frequent transitions, which is a Zeno paradox, if you've heard of that. But it works. Your simulator doesn't like it, but. Um, when you said it goes up and then it goes to a stable point where it's uh, stationary, does it ever go to a point where it'll like kind of try to go up and it'll start falling down? Yeah, that's, uh, so I tried to show that. That might even be the one I have right here. So this is going up, and then it actually comes back and it'll roll forever if I let it simulate for longer. That can happen. So how does that happen on this picture? Okay, you have to think about it. Okay, but if you start close to here, you could go here, bounce over here. Wait, wait, what happened here? Somehow you get out of it like this. Let me see. So. Certainly, if you start here, it's easier to think about if you start um, if you start here. Now I confused myself. Yeah, I think, OK, if you start here, you could either end inside, you get inside and go around, or you could end here and bounce all the way over this and start rolling forward. I, can, I have it plotted here. I don't have to confuse myself. Let's do negative 4.8, OK? So this one started way down here, rolled and got trapped in the, in that, in the fixed point and started going to this. But if I did negative five, then it bounced, oh, that's what it is. It's over here, right? I see. So if you go here, you could go here enough that when you come back on here, on this side, you're above the line to do it. See, that's what happened? It, this arc was large enough that it bounced over here and then made, went forward forever. Right? Pretty good. Yeah? How do you model your contact map? Okay, good. So um, there are general equations for it. The basic um, model is that if you were to, um, if you try to turn on an equality constraint, there's a sort of a general form of how the total energy um, except for that constraint has to be conserved. So in the simple case of the rimless wheel, that is, is physically equ equivalent to having angular momentum conserved around the point of impact, okay? So you know, before impact, you have some angular momentum about that point. After impact, you still have the same angular momentum around that point. Any other energy going into that point is lost, okay? The angular momentum for the rimless wheel is particularly simple. If you write the angular momentum before, just before the impact, I use this sort of superscript as just before impact. It turns out to be, it's just L cross MV. It turns out to be ML squared theta dot just before impact cosine of two alpha. That's just, you know, that's what, it, what you get for the angular momentum if you do the, a little bit of, um, mechanical you know, analysis, and then right after the impact, you get ML squared theta dot plus. This is right after, this is post-impact. 
So basically, it turns out that your energy, the fact that those two things are conserved means that the energy after, or the even the velocity after, was just cosine of two alpha less than the, the velocity, the angular velocity before. Okay, the rimless wheel is the only case where it's like this beautiful and simple, right? But, but it turns out to be beautiful and simple in this case. And you can sort of do a sanity check. So um, if alpha goes to zero, then I'm close to a wheel, right? And this goes to one and I lose no energy, right? If alpha goes to pi over four, then I'm a brick, <laughs> right? And, and I've lost all my energy, right? Okay, so that, that checks out. So angular momentum conserved around the point of collision in that case. Now, when you have a multi-jointed thing, it gets more complicated. You actually have to, um, you know, you, have, you can have sort of internal impacts and stuff like this at the moment of collision. The general form of that is in the notes. Okay, so does this kind of make sense? And the different permutations of things that could possibly happen here, right? We could, the simplest case is I'm just rolling forward and from a large range of initial conditions, I'll just slow down because I lose more energy when I'm moving faster. You can see it right here, the, 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 the energy loss is proportional to the velocity. So I lose more energy when I'm going faster, right? And then <clears throat> when I'm down here, I get trapped and I stand still. And there's this sort of cool thing where I can go uphill and either get trapped or go end up rolling forward, which is the plot right there. Yeah, yeah, no, I, it's, a, it's a totally reasonable question. I don't want to, I don't know the answer for this. We could probably think it through. Uh, I can tell you that the, you have to put conditions in your simulator to check if you're, if you're, con if you're oscillating too fast, otherwise the simulator will just disappear and never come back, right? So um, numerically, it certainly converges quickly to that, to that point, to the point where it becomes numerically challenging. Um, does it, yeah, what, the, what rate it converges? Yeah, but let's think about it after, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's fast, it's a fast convergence, yeah. Okay, the cool thing is we can actually plot the return map and just like we understand from a simple picture, the different fixed points, the different stability, even the regions of attraction on the fixed point, we can understand all of that you know, I can summarize all those complicated things that happen on the rimless wheel with a simple return map plot, okay? So I'll do that again here with, this is now, I'll do theta dot at n versus theta dot at n plus one. This is the n plus one crossing, okay? And I'll choose to, to plot it as the, just after the collision. You can sort of make a choice. You could do it right before the collision or right after the collision, but I'll do it as just after the collision. Okay, the line of slope one still has a lot of, in these discrete time systems, this is just the line of slope one. And what you get is this beautiful thing, okay? There's a couple inflection points, which is, this is corresponding to the energy where you get exactly to the top, right? where you sort of like have exactly the initial velocity where you're, right? Okay, but if you have more than that, then you have a, um, it doesn't ever go back, it's like this, okay? And you have a fixed point here, which has a beautiful big convergence. Like I said, all of this entire region is in the region of attraction of the rolling fixed point.
Okay, it does something a little bit more crazy in here. There's a standing fixed point. Okay, and then over here, it even we can we can just keep plotting it like this. Okay, and since my art I have some, I have limited art skill there. I made the plot on the board. Here I'm, Okay, here it is. All right, so this is the theta dot at, after a collision versus theta dot at the next crossing. I've got a rolling fixed point. I've got a standing fixed point. That's the line of slope one. It's got a beautiful, this, is, this hashed area is the region of attraction to the rolling fixed point. Okay, and it turns out that all of these states are, um, are converged to this, right? And there's these bands of, which actually contract as you come this way, or they expand as you go this way, of initial velocities. You could like take one step and then end up rolling forward, two steps up the ramp, end up rolling forward, three steps up the ramp and go rolling forward. Okay, any number is possible, and they have these bands like this. The standing fixed point, the white, are the regions of attraction of the standing fixed point. And we can just understand everything about this system. The, the, the curves change if you change the ramp, if you change the leg lengths and stuff like this, but they always have, a, 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 they have these closed, sort of closed form solutions. Those green bands are the two places where you, you, you know, end up exactly upright. And you can just understand everything. And that's the last walking system you will ever understand completely, or that I will ever understand completely. I, would, I don't want to project that on you, but, uh, um, but it's, it's my favorite because of that. It's, you can understand it all. And then things get complicated, but the, but the storyline holds, and the thinking holds, okay? Any questions about that, about rimless wheels? They, they are the region of attraction of the standing fixed point. So the hashed is to the rolling fixed point. The white goes to the standing fixed point. So you can go five, st well, there's multiple, if you, in the return map, there's only one standing fixed point, but you could end up standing after taking four steps up the ramp, three steps, whatever. Yes? So I see. So if you had different, um, a non-uniform spoke, uh, like set of spokes or something like that, then you would need a more complicated um, an analysis. But, but I think the the story would still work. You would just need to plot it in. You need to define your return map on, let's say, every time that the fourth leg hits the ground or something like that, and that would just be the composition of these return maps for different alphas, and that would still have a similar dynamics. I think. This return map I, we can get in closed form because integrating, you know, I said integrating across the cycle to get P is hard in general, but in the, in the pendulum case, it's easy. This is just a curve of constant energy. So if I know the energy here, then I just have to find what is the energy where I have theta equals the same energy equals this. So I can just solve in closed form where I'm gonna collide I solve in closed form the loss in the energy, everything's closed form. But that's not true in general. The the standing straight up doesn't appear on the return map. It's between it's a it's a defect in the return map because the return map is defined at the at these places. So that would be a place where you never returned to the which is why they're a singularity. So, so the return map is actually technically not defined on those green lines because you never returned to the return map. Good question. Yeah. Okay. It turns out that that rimless wheel, even though it doesn't feel like we've solved walking robots yet, right? We just looked at a kind of weird bicycle defect, right? It turns out that, uh, that a small change gets you pretty close to a walking robot. Okay, so this is the compass gate. We're gonna take away the extra spokes, add a pin joint at the hip, and now 
I need to add mass to the legs just because if I, if I want to have a pin joint, I need to have some mass in order to define how those two are going to relate. So I have add one extra point mass in each of the legs. Okay, and guess what? This model also works with the same contact model, pin joints snapping on, inelastic collision, conservation of angular momentum around the point of impact. That model also works just fine. Give it a little push. It starts walking down the ramp. Okay, the, the, now I have four state variables, right? Two angles, two derivatives. So I can't plot the phase portrait as nicely. I'll show you the best, my best effort in a second here, okay? But, um, but it still makes stable limit cycles, okay? And they're punctuated by the same jumps. In fact, I'd, I'd have my best effort. Uh, oh yeah, I think I do. Okay, here is plotting just the left leg angle, okay? And now, what do we see here? So when the left leg is the stance leg, then its dynamics looks just like the rimless wheel, okay? But now when the left leg hits the ground, it also becomes the swing leg, so it bounces over here. And then the dynamics of the swing leg are more interesting. They go like that and then come back down, right? And that's this arc over here. Always, when I have an impact, I'm gonna lose angular velocity. So the angular velocity must go closer to zero at the moment of impact. Yeah. And then I return around and I get this nice stable limit cycle. Yeah. Is the vertical line on the right when the other leg locks or yeah. uh, changes? Yes, exactly right. So so that's when when this one hits the ground and I switch over, that's I guess this. And then this is when my when the leg I'm plotting hit the ground. Okay, guess, you know, fast forward in a few weeks, we'll have like regions of attraction around this, and you can think about funnels around limit cycles, and you can do all the, all the stuff, okay? But the first beautiful thing is just thinking about the limit cycle stability. You can analyze its local stability by picking a Poincaré section, taking the eigenvalues of the return map around that, of the Poincaré map. Okay, the basin of attraction of this thing is like weird. That's all. Yeah, so, so if you plot, the, this thing falls down all the time. The rimless wheel, uh, you know, you basically, it'll, it, falling down, the worst thing that happens is it stands still. And, and most initial conditions, it walks. The compass gate, that's not true. There's like a little band of initial conditions. You actually have to typically, you can, with, the, with the simple compass gate, you can just guess some initial conditions and find one that, that walks. Okay, but. Um, as we get more complicated, you actually have to solve an optimization problem just to find an initial condition that, that will successfully walk. And I spent my time building passive walkers and that, that got more complicated and in, in hardware, and they can be a pain, a pain in the butt to, to find, you know, you get like super practiced at starting, you know, like I, like I got to a point where I could start this thing walking and nobody else could, right? <laughs> and uh, the Tad McGear's walkers, right? So. He talked about that knee debouncer, okay? So he actually has suction cups on the kneecaps, okay? So when the, when the knee cam comes around, you have another collision with your kneecap. And he had a suction cup that went <laughs> sucked onto the top of the knee. And the suction cup had a screw off the back. So you could tune the leak rate of the suction cup. So you'd, you'd, you'd be sitting there like, I, I built one too, right? And I was like, you're tuning this thing, and you, you want it to <laughs> just at the right time so that everything falls into step and everything falls down and you break a lot of things in the, in the process. This is the point foot need walker, which is exactly the compass gate with the extra knees. There's two collisions that happen in this limit cycle. That second, that kneecap collision is another one. And so if you plot that limit cycle, it's very similar, but even the stance leg sees the knee strike collision. You get a little one over here. This is the, another one, you know, and then off it goes, goes around. It looks, I just said that you can only have a, a velocity that goes down, but this is in a high, 
higher dimensional space, right? So this is the, sw the swing legs on the ground goes faster because the kneecap hit the, you know, <laughs> hit, a, hit a collision. Yes? This one is, I, I have to solve an optimization problem to find the initial condition. This was very fragile. The, 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 but Tad's robots had big curved feet, and that opens it up again. Right? That's a more complicated model, but it's, it's much more in, uh, useful in practice. Okay, but there's still an art to tuning suction cups and, and knee debouncers, putting the mass in certain places. Right? It takes some work. I have kind of a funny video at the end, so let me ask if there's any serious questions before I, I end on a ridiculous note. Yeah. That's a, br br a brilliant question. So, so um, these are passive walkers; they have to be walking down a slope. Well, actually, the um, the little toy with a string, he had a string with a little weight that pulled it off, the, that, that worked kind of like gravity and that walked on the flat. That's one way to do it. So actually my thesis was on a passive walker that walked on the flat by adding a few actuators. And I used reinforcement learning to learn how to walk on the flat, okay? Um, but yes, one proposal would be to add actuators and try to act, put the same forces in that gravity would have. But that tends to be a little hard because you, you want to only put gra um, actuators in at the hip for instance, and gravity operates both at the hip and the ankle, and you don't want to have a big ankle. But that, that's a, it, it is a nice idea to try to act like gravity. Mm -hmm. All right, so, um, uh, so Andy Ruina and his lab at, at Cornell are, uh, was one of the ones who pushed forward the math and the theory and the and experiment of these after Tad McGear. Uh, he had a student, Steve Collins, who's a faculty at Stanford, very accomplished guy. I just happened to have a video of Steve when he was a student. He's the one who built the 3D passive walker. Really beautiful thing, right? And actually, so Steve Collins and Martin Vissa and I all built actuated robots based on passive dynamic walkers at the same time. So we wrote a paper together and um, we collaborated a bunch on that. Steve's was the best looking robot for sure, <laughs> but it was hard, you know, it had all the suction cup kind of stuff going on. So this is um, Steve and his robot on walking on the flat with all its complexity. Now he's got batteries and electronics and everything like this. <laughs> and he gave me permission to show this. But um, uh, this is, I think, captures a little bit what it's like to work with these robots. Now watch over here. <laughs> See the smoke? <laughs> I actually don't know if the robot ever walked again after that, but um, yeah, that's what it's like to build robots. Cool, okay, so that's just day one of walking. There's a lot more to understand, but that's the simple models, beautiful models of walking. I'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>